Welcome to Big Blend Radio with your hosts, Lisa and Nancy, editors of BigBlendMagazine.com. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Big Blend Radio. Today, we're so excited to welcome Dino Dave on the show. <laughs> Dino <laughs> Dave is uh, David Liebert. Yeah, he is joining us to talk about his incredible career in the world of music, not only as a musician, but as a producer, as a tour guy, a tour guy. I mean, like really like the a rock and roll tour leader. I mean, just actually being in that part of management. He knows every part of the music world. And he's written all about it in his memoir that everybody must read because you're going to laugh out loud. You're going to dig it. Go get it. Mm -hmm. It's called Rock and Roll Warrior. It's totally, as the name is perfect. It's out now on Sunset Boulevard Books. You can get it on Amazon, all those places. But I also encourage you to go to Sunset Boulevard Books on their website and also go to AvailableEntertainment.com. That's a good name. Welcome to the show, Dino Dave. How are you? Well, thank you, Lisa. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. I was going to say, what happens if, you know, the Alice Cooper band, Parliament Funkadelic, and the Runaways had a baby? It would be Dino Dave. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> wouldn't, I be, wouldn't I be adorable? <laughs> that, that would be a good intro. I was like, okay. But, but then I started reading. The, I mean, the list is insane of yeah. everyone that you've worked Great. with. I mean, it's, it's amazing. But And even how you got your start in music, you know, going back to piano classes as a kid and then going into the Air Force, like what, what were you doing in the Air Force? <laughs> I mean, you were playing with big old bomber things going on at the same time as playing a, a, in a club at night. I mean, that's, well, that's that kind of a wild start. Demise, somehow or other, the, uh, the Air Force couldn't seem to adjust to my particular schedule for some reason. Mm. And uh, <laughs> I just wasn't very disciplined. They, uh, uh, that was that was a pretty rough, uh, but yeah, I was playing in a band at night while I was in the Air Force, and I was coming in late to work every day, and and they said, Airman Liebert, you come into work late one more day, yeah. we're going to throw the book at you. The next day I came in late, and they threw the book at me. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. And then next thing you know, you're in music, and uh, just, you and working in a department store too, I mean, but then you go like, so I think there's something in that, though, having these different careers at the beginning, doesn't it teach you the business side for what you did, you know, not just as, you know, a musician, but also being in management and all of that part of it? Did that, did those careers help you, do you think? No, what they taught me, <laughs> uh, uh, what they taught me was I, I didn't want to, I didn't <laughs> want that to be my lot in life. I didn't want to. It taught me what I didn't want to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, uh, and uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then I, I you know, I, I came to the realization that um, I had a moment of clarity, I suppose, that the only thing that was really going to make me happy was a career in, in the music uh, business. As a musician, I didn't really think about the business then, but I knew I had to do something in music and Mm. From that point on, that was my my goal, my pursuit. It, it's interesting, you know, because parents want their children to play a musical instrument, but they don't want them to be a musician. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. it seems it's really kind of like that. You know, it's like go do this class or take piano lessons or violin lessons, but then don't be a musician. Nancy, it's, you did that to me. We we had a band and we've Did done I? we've done some music stuff in our life too and I remember and it was at the end of high school and I started having you know my boyfriend had a band and then I kicked him out of singing because he sucked at it and. Yeah, he did. Then I, I just nosed my way in and then Nancy's like you can't you can't do band stuff and I'm like why not she said you can end up smoking pot. And then I said, well, oh my God. what do you think I've already oh, done? no, not that. <laughs> it's a little late for that. So, <laughs> you know, back then, you know, so, but she was worried because, you know, what what's going to happen to my daughter? And then. That's an it, interesting it, point because uh, I never really thought about it. Yeah, my mother encouraged me to take piano lessons because she felt I had a certain talent. And uh, yeah, it, it was the basis for my musical career, which she 
I remember I said, well, I'm quitting my uh, department store job. I'm going after this music thing. She became hysterical. Yeah. In, in true <laughs> Jewish mother fashion. Oh, you're going to slip me. No, you can't day. beat that. Nancy doesn't do that. That, But that, you can't beat that. Like, But yeah, because there's the, the rock and roll, thing, especially like, well, let's you know. The drugs, the drugs, the alcohol. The yeah. not, no consistency of, of finance either. I think that's what yeah. everyone thinks the starving artist, right? And you did. You lived on ketchup sandwiches. (laughs) Um, I I think to my mother, it was just uh, uh, it was all just pie in the sky that I I just wasn't being responsible. That's what concerned her about it. Uh, She just thought that, uh, well, he's doing something responsible. He got himself a job as an assistant department (laughs) manager at a department store. You know, at least he's he's heading in the right direction. So when I with the store, the department store, she she didn't get it at all. Of course, she ended up being my biggest fan when she realized how uh, focused I was and how hard I was working on it and how disciplined I was about the whole thing. She uh, she turned around about it, became mm-hmm. my biggest fan. Oh, that's cool. When I was going to ask you, and with your songwriting, though, I mean, you you've really got some hits on your belt. I mean, you went from, it's interesting that you went from doing the music side to actually being in the the business side. What was it that led you from going from that? Because I mean, look at your accolades and, you know, everything that's happened. I mean, everyone, he's got all kinds of golden and platinum record things behind him, but you can't see it right now, but he does. <laughs> You've done it, you know? So well, what was let's it hope that- I don't have to smelt it all down someday. Oh, I, think- I know, right? <laughs> Everybody... Hi, get your gold now. <laughs> you <know? laughs> um, you got to remember this was 67, 68, and there was a, um, a, a tremendous change going on within the music industry. All of a sudden, FM radio, which was basically an unlistened to frequency band, uh, just exploded into prominence with the uh, new bands that weren't that AM radio friendly and they were writing albums and playing their own instruments and everything was, it was just a completely different universe. And I, um, I figured the happenings, the band that I was in, yeah, we Mm -hmm. had a few kids under our belt, but we had to, we had to evolve or we weren't going to survive. And I wanted to apply what we did best, which was our harmony techniques and apply mm-hmm. those um, techniques to more contemporary, uh, more modern structures of uh, musically, like Crosby, Stills, and Last, and the Nash were mm-hmm. doing at that time. And the other mm-hmm. happenings uh, would have none of it. They didn't want to. Didn't want to change. They were comfortable where they were, and they felt that they could do that for the next twenty years without hit records. Um, mm-hmm. I didn't want that, and that's yeah. why I left. And. And at that point, I actually had been managing uh, the band myself, even though I was in it. And it, I realized, um, hey, you know what? I could manage other bands and get involved in the uh, in other aspects of the music industry. I was pretty sure I couldn't be a happening forever. Mm. Yeah. I mean, you've written so much for, for others, too, you know, Jerry and the Pacemakers, the Chiffons. Like, think about the Chiffons, man. Mm-hmm. That's, I mean, so that's just classic stuff. It just, you know, reading about your love of like even doo-wop and stuff, I share that love of, of you know, just I think there was something so magical about the songs and the song structure, the simplicity of music and just having it right. And like you're talking about harmony, so important. And I feel sometimes we miss that in music. It, it gets too cluttered. And those that music had soul. You know, it still does, obviously, but there's something about it. Well, if, that- there, if there's one talent that I possess, arguably, it was my ability to um, structure harmonies, which was sort of my job at the happenings as well. I was fascinated with harmony. I listened, yeah, I listened to the Beach Boys and the Four Seasons, but I also listened to bands like the High Lows and the Four Freshmen. Double Six of Paris, Lambert, Hendricks, and Ross, uh, jazz versions of, uh, mm-hmm. of vocal groups. And uh, that was sort of my uh, 
my fascination uh, uh, musically. I I loved uh, I loved harmonies and uh, mm-hmm. those piano lessons. My mother uh, had me take for eight years. Uh, gave me the the foundation to actually uh, yeah mm-hmm. you know uh, uh, build the basis for being able to, to uh, vocal arrange. What what do you think about like bands? like rock bands and like prog rock bands, especially doing harmonies. Like you think about like sticks and, and, and bands like that, that do this harmony, but it's like rock and it's, it's almost, Nancy always keeps wanting people to do rock operas, Yeah, but it's with that harmony. <laughs> Look at Queen, right? They had some amazing yeah. harmonies. They had great, they had great harmonies. You know, mm-hmm. I've had a chance to sort of listen to uh, uh, some classic rock bands. Uh, Queen is one of them. They were really a lot more um, sophisticated than most people give them credit for mm-hmm. their structure. Mm-hmm. So, um, another band that had great harmonies was uh, the Eagles. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's what I wanted to do with the happening. I wanted to apply those kinds of uh, harmony structures to um, to more contemporary uh, music. Um, where mm-hmm. uh, the harmonies would be part of it. It wouldn't be the basis of, of it. You know, th- the happenings, the harmony was everything. That's what they did. And we had a really good lead singer in Bobby Miranda. Uh, but uh, yeah, there are bands like Queen and uh, the Eagles, even the Beatles. They had some mm-hmm. great harmonies. Well, you know, and, and, you know, I look at the Temptations too, man. They did it. They did. They were classic at it too. But then, yep. you know, when, you talk about the Eagles. Remember Seven Bridges Road, that song. I know they didn't write it, but that song to me is when you think about harmony, they really did. They killed it on that one. They they just nailed it so yeah. beautifully on that. And we, we never get to hear that. They keep playing Hotel California over and over. Everywhere. Yeah, they I'm do. just like, stop it, man. I mean, no offense to the song. I'm just we. I, I, do you want to ever see radio change up like when you get in the car to what it was years ago, because you talk about the, the, you know, the stations, whether it's, you know, TV showing the latest music to actual radio stations. Now they're having these playlists and with us driving across the country, I'm, I'm like, dude, you just played this and you're playing the same set list from the county over. <laughs> you know? I think that's due to the advertising. I don't know, but it, I heard yeah, an NPR the, guy doing yeah, the B-sides the other day and yeah. people... Emailing in, telling him to do the other songs. uh, Amazon Music or Apple Music. Yeah, we hear all that. Yeah, Um, I mean, it's a new way, but, you know. That's basically what I listen to in my uh, car. Um, uh, You know, you can, and that's, uh, listen, you can ask uh, Siri or um, um, Alexa. (laughs) Basically, for any uh, song ever recorded, uh, uh, um, any artist, any genre, Mm -hmm. uh, any album, Mm -hmm. uh, nearly by asking for it. I see my little Alexa cube is lighting up because she heard I know she's going to answer you just now. now. Alexa, cancel. I don't want her to play every song. I know. (laughs) She's going to. And. you know, for 10 bucks a month, who's going to buy a CD today? So I, I understand it. Uh, and I'm as guilty as anybody because I do. I, I'll just ask to hear a song and and then mm-hmm. they add the, uh, I guess the algorithm, uh, you ask for the one song, but then the algorithm continues to play other songs as well. Yeah, kinda, that's true. That's kind of cool. Like, Spotify does that too. Like it gives you some suggestions. So you end up listening to people you don't know, you know, exactly. which is great. Yeah, it's a good thing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, you know, speaking of radio, and now are you going to go on Alice Cooper's show and talk about the book? Have you done that, or are you going to? Like, I want to um, hear that interview. <laughs> yeah, I, I um, we're we're trying to schedule it right now. Um, he awesome. uh, he's been very cool. very supportive. He took this picture in full Alice Cooper uh, uh, makeup and costume uh, <laughs> with the book looking like shocked at the uh, uh at what he's reading he's really a very <laughs> generous giving supportive guy and uh, cool. uh so yeah. that that was really 
that was very nice of him. Well, he, mm-hmm. he, you know, I think it's interesting what he's done. We, we were in Greeley, Colorado, of all places. And there's a couple who have been on, on they had their own TV show um, that does all the costumes and does all the really weird stuff for sets. And um, they did his, one of his tours. We were there. We weren't allowed to take photos or anything because, I mean, they had like bloody babies and all kinds of stuff in there, like demons <laughs> and weird Weird there was stuff. just a bunch of weird stuff and we weren't allowed to photograph that because it wasn't out on tour yet. Right. And so going and seeing what they were doing, it was just really, um, to me, amazing how much thought goes into the production of like this show. It's not like a gig, right? <laughs> it's like there's a gig no. and you go and show up. This is like mass production. And yeah. so every yeah. little creature that these people were creating um, you know, that, I mean, these, these things that they were making were really well thought out. So it was when you did billion and dollar babies, which was one of my first albums I bought of Alice Cooper, yeah. uh, did when you went on tour with that, I mean, was it like that was with all those sets and, and all the props and all of that stuff? It was, um, I think Alice was the first, Alice Cooper was the first band to carry their own production. I'm not, I'm talking about sound, lighting, mm-hmm. uh, staging, all the props and uh, all of the uh, costumes and all the monsters. You know, there was a Cyclops. There were giant spiders. There was uh, cool. all kinds of... <laughs> uh, that was always part of the uh, Alice Cooper uh, production. And yeah, it was, uh, it was very complicated and it, it took a lot of... Uh, a lot of thought to create all that stuff, and it, and it took a lot of uh, uh, it took a lot of effort to make it come off properly every night. Yeah, it uh, it didn't happen by chance, that's for sure. A lot of yeah. thought to the process. Yeah, it was distortions unlimited. That's where we were. I had to look that up real quick. That um, who does all those props, and it's like wow. And you know, when you think about going from being in a band and then doing like shows at, at different venues and then doing that kind of level. I mean, that's a, that's a, to be a, a manager of those kind of things and be part of that. That's a ton of work. I mean, how did you balance it all out and not freak out? Like th- every little thing has to happen for the show, the lighting, the sound, the props, the, the musicians. And that's like herding cats, getting musicians all together on stage at the right time. That's hard. (laughs) Fortunately, um, I had really, really good people uh, working for me in in the uh, in the production, the band, too. I mean, everybody understood um, what it entailed to get this show off. And everybody was very much into their jobs to make sure that everything uh, worked perfectly and and the band too i mean uh, the band realized that they couldn't be prima donnas uh, they had to be on time mm-hmm. they had to be ready to roll uh, otherwise it would affect everything and everybody and uh, mm-hmm. i was a tough guy i wouldn't allow anybody to, uh, much slack in that respect you know they can you know, they can party all they want. Uh, you know, basically the rule, you do your job, whether you were a musician or a tech uh, a tech person, uh, you, you did your job as best you possibly could. And the rest of it was, you know, you could do whatever the hell you want. You can party, go crazy, but you had to do your job. Um, Show up. Yeah, it was, it was, you, you know, everything had to work perfectly. Everybody depended on everybody else. So, so what, uh, what come, but come on, people do have drama, right? I mean, our band broke up on stage in front of everybody and all, they had like a big old fight right there. <laughs> Drummers wanting to yeah. stick drumsticks in places that didn't belong, or maybe they did belong. But <laughs> I'm just saying, actually, now that I think of it, he should have done it. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, funny. yeah, I mean, it's just the, the, the band drama and, that and can people happen. Clapped. The audience thought it was an act. Yeah, they thought it was. And an they act. thought it was, it was real. a really funny thing. We, we had a full-on clap. I'm glad I didn't manage your band, Lisa. I'll tell you that. <laughs> it was like a nightmare. <laughs> it was they, a nightmare. On, well, we were in a theater. We were, it, it, which used to be, it was in Julian, California, in, in San Diego, San Diego, up in the mountains. 
and we were in the theater at Mm -hmm. the Pine Hills Lodge, and that was the old (laughs) sparring ring for Jack Dempsey. And then next thing you know, our band decided to be Jack Dempsey, but they weren't good enough to to (laughs) spar like him. So that, I mean, did you see any of that kind of stuff? I mean, just the tensions between bands, like the bandmates. Wow. So everyone's professional, but us. <laughs> it you was, weren't uh, allowed. You simply uh, were not allowed that luxury. You couldn't be that way. If you were a, yeah. a tech person and you were that way, you got fired instantly. No one was going to tolerate that. And no, if it was a band member, I think I mentioned mm-hmm. in the book um, uh, you know, more than once, hardly ever, but I guess a couple of times I had to break some band members uh, hotel door down to get them up and uh, and rolling, you know, so you get to the next town. That rarely happened. And when it did happen, um, that person, that band member was subjected to the silent treatment. Everybody was angry at them. No, you couldn't. Uh, <laughs> it, it just didn't work. Not when you have 40, 50 people on the road and everybody has a, a, the responsibility uh, mm. of an important job. No. You, you, there was just no room for that. Yeah. You know, and what about a, the group drummer too. and the, the drummer and um, the rhythm guitarist that they were they were having did, a they fight. were having trouble playing together. <laughs> yeah. But we did you find out later that, that our band. guitarist was a yes. rapist. And yeah. He was in jail. So there you go. Yeah. That was cool. <laughs> but but what a, I mean, what about all the groupies, too? I mean, how do you manage that? We, we had <laughs> rules. We had groupie rules. Really? Oh. Uh-huh. Yeah, um, you know, because we had our own airplane taking us from town to town. That's cool. It, yeah. Oh, it's a wonderful way to travel. It's so easy for, uh, you know, to entice a girl to come. Hey, you want to want to come to Denver? We're going to Denver. It was just a, a great prop to, uh, <laughs> you know, to entice a girl to, get to you know, to come with uh, either a roadie or or a musician. Uh, what they forgot was as soon as it got the next town, there was just a whole new slew of girls there. And uh, one of the rules was if you took a girl on that plane, she had number one, be 18 years old and prove it. And number two, you owed her a ticket back from where you got her from. I don't mean oh, wow. to sound so cold and heartless, especially in the, you know, the me too uh, uh, era yeah. of it's simply, listen, uh, it simply wasn't that way in the in the seventies. Uh, uh, womanizing on on tours was flagrant, and uh, uh, nobody really thought too much about it. And I guess from our perspective, everybody seemed to be pretty willing. So what was the problem? Of course, that's absolutely unacceptable behavior today. Mm-hmm. But this is then; that was now, right? Um, you know, so uh, so if a guy. Uh, took a girl on the plane and he met another girl and he would go up to another roadie and say, Hey, you know, that girl that I took with us. Uh, yeah, well, you can have her now. <laughs> yeah. She's, she's available. So I would have to hold um, a tour court on the plane to decide what percentage of the ticket, uh, which person owed uh uh, oh my to pay for the ticket to get that girl back from where she came from, and oh my uh, God, it was uh, and and um, wow. uh, if there was anything contentious on on the road, it was that. Uh, um, you know, hmm. well, I was, you know, I was, I never really got to sleep with her, and she was with Joe for three days, and you know, oh. so they would it's, they would uh, argue their case and. And then I would decide which percentage of the ticket each guy would have to pay. That oh was that became rather. Uh, That's uh, funny. That yeah. it is. I'm sorry, but it's funny. It is, and and because I, honestly, girls that are groupies, they went there for that too. You know, come on. You know, they. Yeah. I'm just. I'm just saying. It was like that is part of that whole thing. But then, what about the plaster caster sisters? Did you ever meet them? <laughs> no. <so>. No. I, <laughs> sorry. I, I, I mean, I know all about them, and I met them late, you know, much later on. But, uh, yeah, but it was were, all about going on. It's totally unacceptable naughty. behavior today, but <laughs> you know, <laughs> then it was nobody really thought about it. You know, my being uh, 
uh, am, am, you know, is this womanizing a bad? Nobody really thought yeah. about that. We were just looking to have fun and, you know, no, yeah. And none of the girls seemed to mind. They were, nobody forced them to be there. Exactly. But there was also that, that era too. I mean, of just, well, that was the hippie it. movement too. And all of that. And yeah. so when you did Woodstock, really 99, right. Didn't stuff really go down at that Woodstock? Like, all kinds of craziness went down at that at that concert, right? It wasn't like Woodstock back in the day. This the Woodstock one, you opened the book with it, and I just I remember all these reports that that didn't that just go wild, like people got out of control in the crowds. Uh, the Am original I the wrong one? No, the the one it was ninety nine. That oh, one. I was there. Yeah, um, I you know it's funny because. Um, uh, I missed a lot. I was there with George Clinton. Yeah. And, uh, God, I love him, by the way. He is like, mm, yeah. yeah. That was a, that was amazing. That was the biggest crowd he ever played to, I think, oh. uh, that evening, mm. 100,000 people. Um, and then we left the next day. And I think all of the really horrible stuff erupted just after we left. So we didn't see a lot of the... Uh, you know, the horror that there has been documented. Uh, it just seemed like another festival, it was a big one for sure. So we didn't mm-hmm. see a lot of the, we simply weren't aware of some of the stuff. That yeah. Was going. Like Altamont, that went crazy. I mean, that was supposed to be, hey, we, Woodstock did this, we could do this here. And that went, that was really bad. Listen, that, you put enough people in one place at one yeah, time. Well, <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. You know, the, you know, the chances of something horrible happening uh, uh, getting increasingly uh, possible with the size of the crowd. Mm-hmm. Sure. Mm-hmm. What do you feel like now with crowds and good, the, co- the concert thing is it's, it got really big and then it got to a point it was like too big. And then also the way the ticketing is done. I know right now, look at live nation and Ticketmaster are kind of go, well, they are the same baby. Right. Yeah. And that's become a big deal. And, yeah, and then when we had, you know, COVID first started, the whole thing of not being able to see live music was just a lot of good music came out of it. But damn, that sucks not having live music. That's one of the worst things on the planet is not to have live music. So I think it's coming back, but it's it's different. It is, it is coming back and it is different. And uh, I thought that during COVID um, that there would be a... Um, a burgeoning market for live performances on TV, either pay per view, mm-hmm. and there is a little bit of that now. I, uh, I I've seen a couple of shows. Um, uh, uh, who did I see the other day? Oh, Christina Aguilera. Uh, mm. I thought it was I thought it was terrific. Awesome. Um, but you know, I don't go to concerts. The only concerts I go to now is if I'm invited. And, uh, I get invited backstage, and you know I'm an old, I'm an old guy now. I uh, you're in the high desert of California, though, in Southern California. Do you ever go to Pappy and Harriet's up in Pioneer oh, Town? Oh, absolutely, uh, absolutely. Is that not uh, a badass I, venue? That is one of the I coolest venues. That's God. a that's a that's a great venue, uh, and I do go to shows there. But of course, um, it's not like going to the Staples Center. You know, it's much mm-hmm. more. Uh, yeah, I love Pappy and Harriet. Listen, I don't have all that many friends uh, out here. I'm sort of reclusive. I live here with my girlfriend and, uh, and my three dogs. And uh, have, we have few friends, but one of the friends I have is this uh, lovely couple, John Sortland, who's a drummer for the Shins, mm. and, his, and his girlfriend, who is a bass player. Uh, and she goes out with Albert Hammond Jr. when he does uh, uh, solo tours uh, outside the strokes so we go to shows every once in a while together uh, at uh, Pappy and Harriet's yeah I love that venue it's it's it, a, it's a lot of fun it it really is a cool place we missed Ryan Brian Bingham was on our show a few years back and we missed him like by a I second know. going there which really sucked because yeah I, I mean we used to go to when we lived out there we used to go to Pappy and Harriet's when we could and it's just one of those unique places. I think that's something when, you know, as a musician and then also being a tour manager and, you know, everything you've done in the business, 
don't you think the the venue is there's something about the atmosphere not just the acoustics right but there's there's something about an atmosphere of a venue that just makes it special like there'll never be a pappy and you can't franchise pappy and harriet's no no that would ruin it no you're you're right uh, certain venues have a certain magic <clears throat> and you can feel it when you walk into the place <clears throat> <clears throat> excuse me and pappy and harry's is is uh, certainly one of them i occasionally go to um fantasy springs in india which is a oh, bigger yeah. venue um every once in a while and i'll get invited to, to a show there so you know I'm, i can have dinner there and then hang out backstage i think the last show i saw there was the hollywood vampires with uh, alice cooper joe perry Sweet. and johnny depp that Man, was cool yeah very cool listen the hollywood vampires that is an amazing band and listen johnny depp can play yeah that guy can play like really i i think he's he's Amazing. Yeah. I just love all of them, though. But their stuff is good, you know, yeah. being together. I love it that. A, that they... It was a great show. I, re I really mm -hmm. enjoyed it. And, um... yeah, the last time we the last band we saw out there was actually at the Morongo Casino. Not Morongo. It's outside Indio. If you go on the other side of Joshua Tree National Park, you'll, you'll go to the casino there. And we saw Blood, Sweat and Tears and um, Fantas mm -hmm. probably Fantasy Springs, right? Maybe it was. Maybe it was. Maybe. It was one of the casinos. Blood, Sweat and Tears. And then, oh, my gosh, who did American Woman? Ah, they, their name always Burton escapes Cummings. me. Yeah, they, we, we saw them. They were in the same bill. Guess and who? It was like, guess who? Guess who? Yeah, thank guess you. Who. Guess who? That's it. And then it was just like. It was just classic stuff to go and see, you know. I love it out there. I miss that whole area. But so touring, like if you were going to go and do a tour now and manage a band, who would you want to manage? Nobody. <laughs> no. If I, uh, I don't know, you know, if if a very big act called me, I guess I would consider it. But uh, I'm enjoying my life of leisure now, hanging mm -hmm. out, you know, cool. out here desert uh, um, I don't really have to get out there and earn a living so mm. I and you know I'm going to be 80 years old in a couple of months well happy birthday early yeah <laughs> thank you thank you so I'm not anxious so I'm not really See, you can be in the rock and roll industry and kick butt and have a good time and listen, eventually you know, so if, if you survive yeah. listen if a big band call me you know I suppose if uh uh, but it's never going to happen. So, but, you know, I mean, if Taylor Swift called and said, uh, could you uh, put our production together and, you know, would you be the tour manager? You know, I, I would have to think about it, I suppose, if the money was right. But they're never good. People like that have their own people. And uh, I'm not really anxious. Look, I've done so much. Um, I worked so hard for the better part of uh, five and a half decades. Mm -hmm. I'm perfectly happy to be relaxing on the couch, talking to you, cuddling with my dogs. Mm -hmm. and, uh, you well, know, that's I've, your reward, you know? That's, right. Yeah. Somehow or other, I don't know how, but by the grace of God, somehow I landed on my feet. And uh, mm -hmm. for everything I've been through um, is a miracle in itself. Mm. No, it, it's, it's an incredible career. It's not at all. Mm -hmm. you know? Being in the it, arts, whether it's painting or uh, singing or, you know, being in the arts is a really difficult thing to survive it and actually make money out of it and not compromise who you are. You know, stay true to your your um, craft the way you want to. Right. Well, that's it. an important thing. I've walked away from situations where I could have made terrific money, but I just didn't like the circumstances. Uh, mm hmm and uh you know uh, it, mm. uh, and in retrospect i'm i'm glad i did like there are certain things you really don't want to compromise mm -hmm. and uh mm. and i tried very hard not to mm. you, you know i'm just i when i think about like taylor swift like that's not my thing you know not <laughs> no offense to her just not my thing um but i mean she got 10 billboard hits like the top 10 she cleared the top 10 and i'm going 
How did I mean, that the Beatles happen? didn't do that. Like, wh- how how did she get ten number one? Like, how did she do that? Like, ten the top ten, all ten. I mean, that's amazing. amazing. Actually, yeah. you know, yeah, it's amazing. I think I think all of that is is much more easily manipulated at this point. Look, people, mm. uh, very yeah. very few people can sell albums. She's one of them. She's like the biggest star in the world. She's um, smart. She's very smart. She controls everything. She's in total control of uh, of her career. And uh, yeah, I wonder how she got so smart. I mean, uh, <laughs> she. Um, I don't think she had any schooling, really. I don't think she. Uh, no, she got. She did. She did her. She was really smart in high school. Apparently, I think her parents are smart. Like parent, up there, yeah. and she and she was into business management and accounting and all of that, like all that stuff. And I'm sorry, but you know that's a creative brain. I know people don't think accountants are creative, oh, yes, but if you don't creative. have a creative yeah, one, you're, you're screwed. <laughs> they're very <laughs> creative, and sometimes they end up in jail. <laughs> yes, <laughs> but uh, that's creative. <laughs> it is. It's, it's, it's creative. You have to have a, you know, all lawyers and accountants need to be creative. Otherwise, don't have them. But yeah. yeah, I mean, but she is, she, I read something about her, like, I think she was going to college, you know, while she was rising up there, she was not, um, not going to not get her degree or something no, like that. She, Cause she's really well-spoken. She's very articulate and mm-hmm. obviously she's, she's, she's very intelligent. So I was just wondering about that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think it's, there is an, it is, the industry has just changed so much. That's why I think it's so fascinating of your story because you've been through a lot and seen the industry change from, you know, records <laughs> records to uh, to now digital downloads and streaming. I mean, that's a big. I mean, we've done that in the magazine world. I mean, we used to copy paste and when Nancy had the magazine in South Africa, I mean, we used to typeset with actual typesetting stuff, which right. doesn't exist mm-hmm. now. No. And that's the same in the music industry. How much we've changed. Oh, yeah. You know, it's wild. It's wild. That it's to, a different to universe today. But yeah. you are an amazing writer. Your memoir reads. Yeah, it's so much this. fun. It's like so I don't, fun. I don't want to like I. I it, you want to keep turning the pages, but then you don't want to because it's so delicious. Like you don't want to <laughs> eat the whole cake, but you want to eat the whole cake, and you want to well, eat it all you. now. Thank so you very that, much. it's so much fun to read, and I love that you're so honest. It is so refreshing to have someone just be straight up honest. And um, it well, just you is take really the good with good. the bad. You know, I, I felt I had to put it out there. And, uh, uh, you know, some of it isn't candy coated, that's for sure. No. But also, I, I sort of bent over backwards to try <clears throat> and not throw anybody under the bus. <clears throat> uh, mm-hmm. <clears throat> excuse me. Um, and um, and also, I, I I guess there was a process, you know. When you write a book, you have to decide: Do I really want to put this in the book? How is that person going to feel about it? There are a lot of considerations when you're writing a book about what you want to put in the book. Um, yeah, there are a lot of decisions like that. And, and also, I didn't want it to be a salacious tell-all type of uh type of book um i i wanted it to be more uh, about uh, what it was like to be a fly on the wall with these famous people uh i wanted it to be more introspective and and i wanted it to be informative uh for people reading it and i wanted it to be uh amusing for people reading it mm-hmm. oh, there's, it's there's also good very stories. honest it's very honest mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. which makes That's- it very believable. And I think it's going to help a lot of people that are interested in being in the music industry. Mm-hmm. I think that surviving I think, it. I think, you know, musicians should are mm-hmm. going to, you know, love this obviously. And, and music, I mean, anybody in the, in man, and who doesn't love music? If you don't love music, like, <laughs> stay, stay, stay away from my car. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, but every music lover, I mean, it's like, you, it's like, who haven't you met? I mean, you, you have Prince, I mean, and, and working with Sheila E, who I think is still one of the best drummers on the planet, her and She's Cindy Blackman, too. Yeah, Cindy, Cindy Blackman. 
Sheila E., I remember as a little girl watching her, mm-hmm. not too little, but, you know, teen, yeah. teenager, watching her because you never really got to see women playing drums and just how she, I mean, she just, she has like fire. Like she's like on fire. She's like, yeah, look she's at me. She's a hell of a saxophone player too, by the way. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, she is. She's well versed I mean, in several instruments. And, oh, this is the, I, I have to bring this up. You talk about Miriam Makeba and Makeba and we lived in South Africa and her music was like a soundtrack for, you know, just, I'm, it's in me. You know what I mean? You grow up with her. We talk about, and I, she was, huh. Did you ever get to meet her ever? Just, no, she was just so, no. God, she's amazing. I was a huge fan of hers. I remember mm-hmm. the, remember the click song? The click, click, yep, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yep. Uh, you know, when I was younger, when I was a teenager, um, I used to listen to this New York jazz show, Symphony Sid. He was the mm-hmm. DJ, and he played a lot of uh, stuff that influenced me. He loved Miriam McKeever, and he played her. He played her. He played Nina Simone. I'm trying mm. to think of the women that the, Sarah Vaughn. Uh, oh yeah, mm. I came to appreciate the um a lot of these talented women they were so good and uh, Miriam and I never you know it only I, it was only like a little while ago I realized she was married to Hugh Masekela and I didn't I don't know why because I was so interested in music you know it's not like we had Google when I was a kid in South Africa but <laughs> her music was so big and so she was just so larger than life with her voice and whenever people talk about singers I'm like go to her that's this voice that you can't there, there's no one like her ever i mean it's just ever. that pure mm, she just she was she was and she was a good person who did a lot who stood up for right things you know yeah and yeah. um yeah so i just as soon as i saw that in your book because no one i don't hear anybody talk about her you know i don't know i, just, I feel like i'm alone in the on the planet knowing about her but i know she was famous and did a bunch but um yeah, that's that's a that's amazing. Just and it's amazing. Go from Mary McCabe to Alice Cooper, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> I love that. I love that. And I hear that you possibly this this memoir of yours could end up on the big screen. They're kicking it around. Wouldn't that be nice? Oh, be I fun. think. Oh, dude, wouldn't that be fun? Like wow. seriously, like it has to happen. It has to. Well, I hope it was. Uh, they're they're kicking around an, uh, um, about op- uh, an option right now, and and that would be the start of it all. And uh, yeah, that would be terrific. Uh, um, I, I I you know I, I have a feeling. Who knows? But I have a feeling that it may not be me, but it may be about a person like me. I'm not sure how this is all going to turn out, but I guess we'll have to wait and see. Oh, it's one of those based on, based on this, like the based on mm. kind of, this was based yeah. on this story. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I mean. Yeah. But still, it's still your story. Your story's cool. And you've, you've worked with so many people. Um, Carmine Epis, am I saying it correctly yet? I'm, when he was on our show, I still screwed it up no matter what we did. Like, I still messed up his name. And he just, he just looked well, at me like, odd, you know. You know, Carmine, he refers to his last name as a piece, Carmine a piece. And his brother, Vinny, refers to himself as Vinny Apice. So, so, oh, wow. Yeah, oh. they pronounce your last names differently. And by the way, um, uh, uh, Carmine is one of my very closest friends. He and his uh, girlfriend Leslie. Uh, he's he's lovely, funny. Lovely well, Vanilla Fudge, like, he, and he said that he's going. He's doing more with Cactus now. And we interviewed him. I think it was last year, Nancy. Something. Was it last year or this year? I, I can't remember. You know, who knows? I don't keep track of time anymore. But it's he was out in <laughs> he was out in Florida. Yeah, that's where he, he's based. Yeah, he, and he what a heck of a conversation we had. He told us told me how to take care of my car. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, he, he's he's the most entrepreneurial mm-hmm. musician I've ever uh, worked with. Uh, he's got the yeah. hanging and banging show. Yeah, yeah. He's, like, yeah. He's, yeah. he's a trip. I mean, you've worked with so many people. It's got to be so, living color. 
I'm, you know, yeah. They're one of the greatest live bands that ever existed. I love those guys. Yeah. So George Clinton, I mean, the funk, like, seriously, that is huge to me, personally. I just, there's this energy of fun, like, that it just, I, 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 I want that. Like, that is what we should have <laughs> to chill people out because everybody's all angry. I mean, we're recording this on voting day, you know, everyone's just all yeah. busy with each other, but yeah. I kind of feel like we need that funk back in music. Hey, what did George say? Ain't no party like a P funk party and a P funk party. Don't stop. Mm-hmm. Flashlight. And, it, <laughs> mm-hmm. and I'll tell you, uh, there's nothing like a P funk show. I mean, the way the audience engages in the whole thing and, it's it's really uh, it's a unique feeling, something to behold, to be in the middle of a of a P funk show. I mean, the oh, place man. is just rocking. And it's positive, you know what I mean? It's 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 got yeah, the it's sex part of in it, but it's feeling it's, good it's, and having fun. Yeah, yeah. It, it's like get down with yourself. You just get just stop. You know, get rid of all the other stuff and just have a good time. You know, in your mind and your ass will follow. uh, (laughs) I love it. I love it. On that note, thank you so much for joining us. It has been a true delight having you on the show. Everyone, uh, David Liebert is the name, the book, Rock and Roll Warrior. Go get it. It's out through Sunset Boulevard Books. It's on Amazon, all those places. Go to AvailableEntertainment.com. That's a good name, Available Entertainment. I mean, Mm -hmm. it's like. Hey, straight up. We're here. <laughs> Get it now. Uh, we do have to thank our sponsors, which uh, are Steve and Karen Wilson, who own and run the Lion and the Rose Bed and Breakfast in Asheville. They said they are like major music people and they run a, a bed and breakfast. that's this Victorian mansion, but it ain't like your grandma's. No. Nope. If you love music, go hang out with them. They no dusty here. doilies. There's no dusty <laughs> doilies. You go in. It's historic. It's beautiful. But they are super cool. When you check in, they give you a glass of home brewed beer and you get to play with their dogs and they do a lot of dog rescue too. So I know they're going to be happy to sponsor this because you also are passionate about dogs and their dog people with Ozzy and Oreo. They're two little doggies. Mm -hmm. So everyone lion dash rose.com. If you go to Asheville, North Carolina, stop by and say hi to our good friends. And of course, keep up with us at bigblendradio.com. Thank you so much for joining us, Dave. It was my pleasure. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you for having me. All right. Pleasure.